Hey everybody, I am Cinnamon Cooney, your art Sherpa, and today I'm going to show you every technique and concept a beginner needs to know, especially in the first years of painting, to have a more confident, enjoyable time when they are painting. To help me do this is my husband, John. Hello. He is going to make sure that the cameras are pointed at the techniques, and I am demonstrating today. You can paint along with me if you want to practice these techniques in real time, and we are going to be going through a lot of them. We're going to be going deep into techniques. We're going to be covering everything from blow to brush, how much water, all kinds of information about your paint on your palette to core techniques so that you can paint. My goal for this course, the whole course in general, which is part of a beginner acrylic painting course, which is several videos, is that as a beginner, when you go through it, you come out of it really able to do those first paintings. And we're building up all those skills now for 10 coming up. Uh, if you're just here for techniques, this really is a good video for that because I've been teaching online for seven years, answering questions for beginners. And I really kind of have an idea of the stuff that as a teacher, we would know you guys would struggle with, but only through experience uh, would I be able to know that you guys struggle with based on all the questions that you've asked me. Now, uh, John? Yes. The first thing I'd like to talk to them about is the Goldilocks zone. Oh, would you? We don't need to demo the Goldilocks zone. I'm just going to explain to you the concept and then we'll go in and apply how the Goldilocks zone applies to painting. So you'll hear me if you paint with me. If you've never painted with anyone, you do want to stop if you're a beginner and you've been struggling. Um, because this will explain why you might be struggling. Hello, my head is so big. More Sherpa. <laughs> More me. All right. So here's the situation. In... Do you guys remember the fairy tale of three bears? No. No. You had but kids. You absolutely remember the fairy tale of three bears. Anyways, maybe. there was Goldilocks and the three bears. Maybe you've heard the story. Maybe you haven't. But the basic concept is there was a little girl lost in the woods and she came across a bear house. And in the house lived three bears, a papa bear, a mama bear, and a baby bear. And the little girl went through their house, kind of ransacking it, eating their food and trying out their stuff to determine what was just right for her. Now, um, violation of the bear's property rights <laughs> aside <laughs> which, petty larceny aside <laughs> all that aside right <laughs> the squatting of goldilocks aside of all of that or the fact you know um the concept there is finding what's just right and what was just right for the papa bear and the mama bear and the baby bear was not uniform my paint your paint my brushes your brushes my canvas your canvas my studio's environment your studio's environment are not homogenous they're not the same and so that space where the brush and the paint and the water and the canvas all work together perfectly to execute our ideas and our creativity into techniques um, can be different, right? So I'm just saying this to you because when you learn online, I don't know if we say this to you guys enough as teachers, is that your experience may be slightly different than mine at home. Your paint might have a different Goldilocks zone for water than mine. Right. Like if I'm painting and, and even between paints, even in my own studio, my golden heavy body paint, it, it makes a little more water than my whole wine paint. Right. So it, everyone is different. Every brush is different. And what you're looking for is to start to tune in on your art materials, your techniques, your studio when you're in the Goldilocks zone. And learning how to do that will make all classes, all seminars, all paintings a thousand percent easier. OK. We must go on, John, into how to load a brush. Very important stuff. Kidding aside, we're table, baby. You're getting ready to go to the table. Mm -hmm. Here we this go. This is table. Zoom to the table, and then you get a little shirt. <laughs> little me. All right. So we're going to start talking about how we load a brush. Oh, my goodness. You know what, John? No. I moved the water cups so they wouldn't spill while you were fixing the camera. That's okay. And I can't load a brush without them. Yeah? Yeah. I They're over that. there on that table. Don't worry. I get it. Okay. He's going to get that. See? Live. Live, live. When I go, it's live, 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 you can be like, oh, it's going to be fun today. We had actually pre-worked out this video, and then um, one of the camera angles failed, and so we're doing it again. Sometimes technology comes and gets you. So loading a brush. One of the things that... Um, uh, what? Uh, I was just talking, but yes, I would love my lower Hold thirds. On. I will get you that. Do, do, Hopefully do. you guys are having this on the uh, timestamps as uh. we're going through trying to catch some of these timestamps. Um, so we're going to be going over how you load a brush and we're going to talk first about, scoop me over. I will. I'm how to properly, for the, for the lower thirds, how to properly load a brush, right? 
And you'll know you're properly loaded. One of the big questions I get from you guys at home is, I see you painting. I have the same paint. I have the same brush. I have a cup of water also. Same canvas. I got my humidifier. You're like, I did everything. And my brush load is not working like yours. And that's because you may be struggling with how to properly load a brush. So let's start with a, I've got a number 10 bright here. This actually is called Goldilocks in the Art Sherpa line. That's kind of a fun fact you guys may not know. First, we're going to get the cup of water. When I'm loading an acrylic brush with water, I don't dunk the whole brush down deep. I only do that when I'm rinsing out. For this, I'm going to take the brush to the ferrule in the water. And I'm going to drag off the extra. Right now my brush is thoroughly damp through the filaments. I've drug off the extra water. So hopefully I don't have tons of water in here. And I'm going to come from the outside of the paint and flip the brush over and flip the brush over. So I'm creating a landing strip. I'm pulling paint into the brush and pulling it away. If I want to add more water into the mix, I'm going to do that slowly. I'm going to get a drop. Right. See how I'm getting this drop on just the corner of my brush. It just barely goes in. That's how I'm controlling how much water is in my brush. When that feels when it's in the Goldilocks zone, when it feels like it's flowing smoothly into my brush, then I can come to my surface and I begin to paint back and forth, flipping the brush over. Right. And all that paint I loaded into it. You see if I can can go something. right off the brush and you can see I can go quite far because I've loaded quite a lot of paint now there's still some paint at the belly you know and you can get that out or you can rinse that out or wipe that out but that's how I get more paint for my brush strokes right that's how I do that now I'm gonna rinse this out now when I'm rinsing out guys and we're going to talk about it a little bit. I want to make sure that I am. Oh, that's weird. I don't know how to get. Oh, hold on a second. <laughs> Do... I'm trying to go. get in there. I was a, on a different screen making an adjustment. And we'll make this a whole like segment, but I'm just like showing you that. Okay. Dry brushing. Let's talk dry brushing. Uh, okay. Well, there's some oh, clues in the name, right? I'll get a, I'm going to get. Uh, Look at this. Hmm? Dry brushing. Dry brushing. Some clues in the name. One of the first clues is, is I'm not going to go grab water. <laughs> That's one of the first clues. And when I go to mix the paint, I'm going to load it pretty dry onto my brush and not too heavy. Look how light that load is. You can hardly see it on the dark filaments of the brush. It's almost invisible. And then my pressure is going to be super light. Right? And you can even see if you have canvas texture, you can see a lot of that texture. Kind of absolutely coming through. So that's the appropriate load for dry brushing. Your brush is either completely dry or nearly dry. And what I mean is nearly is like when you're dry brushing, you may have to change colors where you'd want to thoroughly rinse out. Mm. Right? And then you would dry with a towel your brush completely, really pulling out that moisture. Hold on. Are you... Teaching them right now how to rinse a brush? No, I wasn't, okay. but we could, we're going to put that up. I'm actually going to do a whole thing on that. Yeah, yeah, I thought but so. I, I just want to make sure. I always kind of talk about that, but we're going to really talk about okay, it. Okay, good. I just want to make sure. Own I didn't segment, miss. right? I'm continuing to dry brush. Next one is edge load. So see how I'm dry brushing over what I have? Oh, you want, this is edge loading? When we're next, next will be edge loading. Oh. Right now we're still dry brushing. Oh, are we? We've okay, still so we've changed colors sorry. and we're still dry brushing. I'm I'm getting I see, see dry brushing. Such a, a UK. You guys knew what our it's home week was like this week. You would be like so amazed we're here today. We're still right. dry brushing. Let's edge load now. Not that button though. No. So sometimes button. in painting you need to uh, load the toe of the brush. <gasps> Look at the button. Let's get that set to a full screen. You want to go to there? Yeah, just Ah. for a second, and then we'll get in close. So it's important to know the parts of the brush. I'm going to be talking about the toe of the brush. If you don't know a lot about brushes, please watch my beginners, everything they need to know about brushes video. But here on the toe is where we're going to be edge loading. And as you guys know, every brush has a toe, right? That's the end of the filament. So I'm going to come here. Let's do it on the white where you can really see it. And I'm going to edge load a little blue. Right. 
So edge loading means I'm just coming to the edge of the brush. It's not deep, is it? Look at that. I'm going to go around the other side real quick. No, you run that to the other side. All right, look at that. There you go. So that's just to the end of the toe, right? That's not a lot of paint, and I've loaded it just on the edge there. So when you Whoa. hear somebody talk about edge loading, let's edge load some red. That's very loaded. Right? They're just edge loading. It's just, it's not on both sides of the brush. It's on one side of the brush. Right? And you've just loaded the edge. Wow. Right? So you could do that on a round brush. You know? You would be doing it just on the toe. Right? So, like, you would just be doing just the toe. Let's see if we can capture that on camera. See how that's just on the toe of the brush? I do. No, obviously it might be a little more on all sides because it's a round brush, but we haven't loaded it up through the belly. I see. All right. We got to talk about how to rinse out a brush. Do we? So there's a couple things we need to think about, and I'm going to pull my thing out. When you're rinsing out brushes, when you're acrylic painting, you're going to want paper towels. You're going to want a sacrificial towel for your paint when you're changing colors, and you're going to want a cup of water. And I'm going to move my cup over here because you actually want your water and your paint all oriented to your dominant side. I'm going to uh, get my brush wet, and let's put some paint into it. Let's say we're painting. All right. Let's say we're just a painting away. That's easy to pretend. All right. And I'm painting, painting, painting. It's so exciting. Here I go. But I need to change colors and I need to rinse out my brush. And I'm going to go to my yellow. I want, I want my yellow to be very yellow. I have to properly be able to rinse out my brush to accomplish that. I've got a round brush. This will demonstrate something that happens with all brushes. First thing is I'm going to take my brush. Let's do it on the clear water so you can see it. So you can see the bottom of the cup there. Take your brush down to the bottom. And I'm going to use a little bit of pressure very carefully. I'm not scumbling. I'm brushing back and forth to get the water out of the brush, the paint out of the brush. Now, when I come up, notice, uh, let's see if the paper towel will show. When I come up, there's drips. And all on the handle is water because I had to go deep. So I have to wipe my brush. And then you're going to want to check on a paper towel. See how I'm checking on my paper towel Let me here? Let down there and check that. I don't have any pigment on here, which means I can safely go to yellow from red and have that be a pure yellow. Now, you can imagine this is an important skill if you have a limited number of brushes and you have to change colors and you don't want your colors to get muddy. I'm rinsing again. You heard that vigorous swish. I'm wiping off. You don't always see myself, other artists, wiping off the handles of our brushes, but we do it. You may not see us wiping off our brushes on a paper towel, but we do it. And those are important things to know. The last one is that you've got to be able to control the amount of water in your brush. Some techniques you want to use very little water, like dry brushing. Some techniques you want to use a little more water, right? If you don't, drag off right and control the water and you come here to the yellow look how wet that suddenly is so when i come here it's really wet if i come here look how wet that is i didn't control my water now i have too much water on my palette right for any other types than wet techniques and i don't want to be doing uh wet techniques on canvas. I would only do those on paper. So, you know, for the most part. For the most part. For the most part. I'm kind of pulling this up because I really am going to be working a dryer wet palette today. I have. So see, I if I'm controlling my water, I have to know when I have more. We'll let these drips. <gasps> it's super. Let me go over and look yeah. at the drips. But that is how I would get a drip technique, right? Cut to drips. <laughs> So you go from this Aww. to dry brush to this by controlling your water. And when I do these three techniques, again, from paint to paint, it's a different amount of water. And every brush I have holds a different amount of water. 
So that's a real kind of skill set that you develop through experience. Those drips are pretty cool. They are pretty, aren't they? All right. How are we doing? How's everybody doing? Oh, I think pretty good, but I am all on the buttons today, I think. Are you all on the buttons? All the buttons. Let's talk about uh, paint drying. Is this a... How to watch paint dry, yeah. Let's see if we can do that. Paint dry. We can watch paint dry. Knowing when your acrylic paint is dry is a big deal. Mm -hmm. It's really important to your success. So when we put out the paint, I'm going to put out some blue here. Nice little run of blue. Let's grab some red right into that. I'm going to make a little bit of a deep purple. Well, let's see if we can capture. I think we can kind of see it on the overhead. And maybe if I turn it. Do you see how the paint is shiny? Oh, yeah. Now, some acrylic is glossy and some acrylic is matte. But that's relative to its dry state. Right? It's all pretty matte compared to when it's wet unless it's varnished. So to know that my paint is dry, it's going to be flat and matte. See how these aren't shiny, but this is still shiny? I can't move this, but if I go here, I can move this. Yeah. That's because this is dry and this is wet. So you want to be able to, by sight, recognize when your paint is dry. If I need my paint to be dry to do a technique, I have to be able to tell when it's dry. If I need my paint to be wet to do a technique, I have to be able to tell when it's wet. I see you guys a lot of times at home on like a three color blend get stuck where you have a stripe and a stripe and a stripe. And that's because you're having trouble managing and knowing when your paint is wet enough to blend. So this would be when is paint dry? When is paint dry? And sometimes where is the E? <laughs> what? Nothing. Everything's fine. You know what? Um, we're not a spelling channel. The hair dryer. Let's have a quick talk about the hair dryer. Let's see, we're not a spelling channel, so it's fine. We really are not. How are you guys doing? <laughs> okay. So sometimes we have time for the paint to dry. When acrylic paint dries, it does a thing called color shift. Most paint has a color shift. It's the state of color when it's wet versus the state of color when it's dry. Have you ever picked up a river rock and put some water on it and the river rock's colors were suddenly revealed? Mm -hmm. It's basically like that. So good paint tries to give you some sense of what color the river rock would be when wet. Um, but all paint as it dries has some change of color. Acrylic paint, for the most part, dar darkens. So if you paint watercolor with me, you'll notice that the paint lightens a little bit. Acrylic paint darkens. Some paint, some inexpensive paint, darkens a lot. You will need to identify in your own studio if your paint has completely changed a whole value. That means getting darker from when it was wet. Because you'll have to paint a lighter value than what you're seeing in your reference or in your classes, okay? I'm gonna dry this with a hair dryer. Before I do, I'm gonna tell you a couple things we always tell students. The first thing we always tell students is that you wanna put this on the low setting. Mm -hmm. There's a variety of reasons why we do that. Excuse me, I'm gonna have a little. Yeah, you're muted. I muted you, you may have a, okay, you're back. You... <laughs> I ate really fast before the class. There's... Oh, but you happens. don't need to hear that at all. No, like, <laughs> that's why we got mute it. buttons. So we talked to this about our students. You'll hear it talking about in class, and I want to give you the kind of good and bad and ugly of this. Mm. I put this on the low setting for two reasons. Some paint is temperature sensitive, and even the warm setting on your hair dryer will absolutely make the color shift worse. Good paint, it won't really change or alter that. Inexpensive paint, it might, which is why we always err to the, the worst possible situation you could be in. That's what we try to error to. We don't error to that you're using professional paints. We don't error to that it's cadmium yellow pigment. We error assuming that you're gonna be having the challenge, you know, at the furthest beginning level of error. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that's what we're leaning to. If you're painting on golden, you don't gotta worry about this, but if you're painting on a, an off-brand, who knows where, craft paint, you may see significant color shift. So you put this on the lowest setting. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. 
Okay, so while she's doing that, I will say this is where you sometimes hear me make my, you know, color, my color shift, don't use heat, public service announcement. That's what's been sort of joked about. It's, you know, it is and it isn't a big deal. So it's just one of those things to be aware of. The big thing is, is the not to use heat because it is plastic and it uh, gets sticky and can be uh, all sorts of, um, it just, it, heat is not something you want to uh, add to paint. Okay. So, and I was just as unprepared to talk as I always am. Oh, so good. that was great. All right. So it looks dry. Can you see how this looks dry? It's not wet, shiny anymore, except this, this paint here. So you can, can you see how some of it's still wet? You can see what's wet and what's dry, can't you? Now, some of this paint might look dry and not be dry. So we're going to, I'm going to test it to see if any of it. Okay. Do you see here? Let's where see. I'm able to lift the paint up from the surface as I get it wet. with this technique and I'll pull some up. Now, paint that's thoroughly, thoroughly dry. I cannot lift. So when it's all the way dry, you can't lift it back up. When it's dry to the surface, but not cured, you can. This is a big deal um, with water drips. This is a big deal if you're doing a dry brush or rough technique over what you think is dry paint. Um, you know, there's a lot of times when the paint will lift up on you. I see you guys, you'll think it's dry and you'll paint over it. And it's like the whole underneath lifts. Raise your hand if you've had that experience. You thought it was dry and it was lifting. So acrylic paint has a state where it's cured. That means it's going nowhere. You can fix a mistake on this paint versus um, it's sort of dry, dry enough to paint over, dry enough to dry brush on, but it's not fully cured. So it's not fully bonded to the surface yet. And understanding when you're here or here can help you make a decision on how you would fix a mistake or do a technique. All right, we're doing pretty good. If you guys have questions, um, put them in caps. Uh, the moderators, I, I'm not in chat today, so the moderators are going to try to help you find those answers, and then I'm going to go through them. Um, if it's an important question, put it in the comments after the show. If you're here on the replay, always put it in the comments after the show. I go back to old videos and answer questions. All right. The other thing I'm going to talk about paint drying is you should not use extreme heat with acrylic paint. Uh, even at the temperature of a dryer, it starts to off gas formaldehyde. It's not something that happens in regular air studio conditions. It's an, like a hot car or your hair, your, like a, like a heat dryer you know, or a torch would do it. So you do want to keep that in mind that you don't want to get anything to a high temperature. My toes like the new high temperature of my toasty toes. Do they? Yeah. You like that? I do like that. Are you ready? Uh, one last thing I'm going to oh. say. If you're doing a hair dryer into a wet technique, if it's not stable enough, you can move a drop where you don't want it to go. So just be oh. aware that your drops have to be uh, dry enough to hold shape. That's that's everything you have to say about a hair dryer. It's a that's, lot, though. That's it. Yeah, that's, that's what I have got. to say. I think we get to we get to go to mixing paint on the palette. Like when I said every beginner painting technique that you need to know in that first year, I meant it. You did. All right. Now I have my primary blue, my primary yellow, and my primary red out. And you'll notice that they are put to the sort of outer edges of the palette, right? When I put my white out, which is the color I'm going to use the twice, twice the amount of, um, I'm going to put it to the center. Now on these types of pouches, and sometimes in tubes, you can get an air pocket. So you've got to mix real close to the palette. And I'm going to press off, that's tube or pouch, uh, to release the paint. So that's how I get that there. I'm going to put my white in oh, the center because I'm going to use it the most with the colors that I have. Hold on. I, I zoomed the wrong one. Give me mm. a second. Let's zoom this. And we're going to do this with black. I will be using black, but it's going to go to the outside edge over here. I'm going to squeeze slowly because there could be an air pocket. And if there's an air pocket, it might explode. If I'm squeezing it off, then I can put it close to that and kind of Scrape the paint off the edge of my tube. 
So now I have my colors to the outside edge and my white in the center. There's always variants of this, but this is just a good place to start. Paint management. Think about where your colors are. Don't just put them any old place because you've got to have room between them to mix colors. Mm. Right? I have room, like right now I have some room here and I have some room here and 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 all through here to mix colors. I have a lot of room. I get asked all the time by students, how do you control your paint palette? This is where it starts. <laughs> Just, did you get the color placement? We did. Okay. The next one that we want to do is. Is it the wrong way to mix? Yeah. The wrong way. Oh, there way it is. I lost my mix. place. I took notes so I don't. So that we're together. The wrong way to mix. I see this all the time. And I'm going to explain to you why it creates a problem. And it's something that I feel started in the painting party industry. Um, and just because so many teachers like came on from there, including myself, um, it sort of carried over into online art education. It mm. isn't something you would see in a traditional art class in general. So here's what it is. A lot of times people will come in and they will show you <gasps> the scoop the scoop from the center of the plop. And then they're going to come over and say they want a little white and they're oh, going to no. scoop. But do you see what's happened here to my white paint? It's submarined. Right now. Yeah. Maybe I'll get a nice little technique here. Yep. That I could do cool for the little party. Right. That's very cool. Very that was cool. cool. That was actually you know, like you kind of <laughs> double loaded it. But double loaded it. All the things that you've got to be able to do. But now. You sacrificed the paint. None of this paint. And I'll show you why. Let's say I take some of my yellow out and I want to make some lightened yellow. Oh, no. The green will suddenly come out. I'm not going to get a ducky yellow. I'm going to get a bright green. And as long as that blue is there. And it's so polluted. It's so polluted. You can't. I mean, it's this white pollutes so quickly. Well, it all pollutes so quickly. So if you do a few of those little center scoop mixes Tint pretty shade. quickly. Your paint that you put out on your palette is fairly contaminated and it becomes harder and harder and harder to get colors. Now, if I, let's rinse out. Remember, we're talking about paint management and water quality. Okay, and I'm oh. wiping out on my paper towel just to make sure. If I come from the outer edge of a color. Wait, is this the right way to do it? This is the right, oh yeah, let's do it. The right way. The right way. <laughs> just, I hate to say things like the right and wrong way in art. But sometimes in the beginning, you need those guardrails, and we, you can break them later, but this is for just right now, so you don't have a miserable time. We can safely say this is not the wrong way. Depends, for the most part now. <laughs> so there's only two absolute rules at art, and, and none of we're not going to cover any of them today because you're not going to run into One of them is don't set fire to your paint. And, of course, there's an artist that breaks that rule, but they do it with safety conditions, right? <laughs> don't eat your paint. But then again, there's an artist that eats their paint and goes, so there's very tough to that. give there's, rules. There's, there's, there's whole, there's like holes and holes in art. There's holes and holes and holes. And so there's, what I'm telling you is what's going to get you through the first couple of years. Happy, happy Just mixing artists that paint you are. For now. So if I take my yellow from here in that landing strip, like I do, right. And I come over and I get a little blue from the outside edge. Look how all my blues stayed very good. And I bring it here. Ooh. Right, I've got a green. Now I can come in and very uh, easily add a little more blue if I want to darken that. But right? just from that one little place where you where you got the the, the, the blue from, you didn't like. I go still back have my to the yellow. Middle. But if I had gone in with my blue in the middle of my yellow, well, phthalo blue or uh, any yeah. of the blues, really, all of them are very staining, which mm -hmm. means all of the area where that blue is, I couldn't use it. And if it got into any mixes, boom, it doesn't take a lot. All right. Like if I were to demonstrate to you. Notice that I still have yellow on my brush, which is why I'm you see that. wiping out. Let's just take the smallest, smidgiest amount of blue. It's just on a hair. Pretty green, pretty fast, isn't it? It is. It was one hair's worth of blue. It's a very staining color. That's why the water makes a difference. That's why your water makes a difference. Exactly. Speaking of, we'll have to switch out pretty soon. That gray water you had there? Yeah. This would be... The murk. The murk. You need to move the murk. Want to know how we dispose of water? We have a whole video on that on studio setup. 
because you do need to think about how you're disposing of water. <sighs> okay, we did the wrong way to mix, the right way to mix. Let's do the idea of thoroughly mixed, thoroughly mixed. So in paint colors, and you've been kind of seeing me thoroughly mix a color. This, right? this may be thoroughly mixed. I don't know, like two. John doesn't really spell. Two, two, two I, mean, I spell things. even less, so that's where we are. Yeah. Okay. When I want to thoroughly mix a color, what that means is I want the two colors combined, folded in, integrated until they become a third <laughs> other hue, right? So if I were to take red, right, and I were to take white and mix and mix and mix and mix and mix until, remember that was like the... It's thoroughly mixed. Thoroughly mixed. <laughs> thoroughly We're going to get so mixed. many notes from the internet. It's okay. two paints diverged on a palette. You see how that's pink? I see the pink. Right. Whereas, you know, this is maybe, they've got a little straight streak in it, right? So I'm not getting that even pink tone. If I'm trying to get an even pink tone, I have to thoroughly mix it. And you can see that I'm incorporating, I'm swirling the brush around. What is not happening? The paint is not creeping up my ferrule. I haven't done the dip. I've taken small manageable amounts of paint that I'm mixing on the edge, on the edge of the brush. And because I do it this way, look what's not happening. It's not climbing up the ferrule. How many people have had it climb up the ferrule on them? It's very hard to control. It feels like it's just everywhere. Thoroughly mixed. If I can thoroughly mix paint and I understand my color mixing, I can make a color again and again and again an infinite number of times. Mm -hmm. So I don't have to buy every color that isn't every tube of every paint at the store. I only need to buy a few colors for my palette because I can make the other colors or I can make their hues at least. All right. Shall we do loosely mixed? We can. Now, in painting, uh, we have a thing that we do, and it's a loosely mixed paint. And what this is, let's say I'm going to make an orange, and I'm going to take a little yellow and a little red, and I'm going to loosely mix it. Notice how it's loaded on my brush. Let's see if we can get up uh, close onto this. You see that, guys? I see it. It's not orange. It is a little orange and red. I might come and get a little more yellow, but it's loosely mixed. You can see the streaks in it. If I were to get some white into that. And it's mixing on the canvas, isn't it? It is. Now that's something that we do in a variety of our techniques. And so understanding when a paint is thoroughly mixed or loosely mixed can really alter your result. Often I am loosely mixing things and allowing them to happen on the canvas. But then other times I'm very specifically thoroughly mixing. I will always try as a teacher to let you know when that's happening. Um, but you knowing by sight what's going on will really always help you. Uh, you know, there's a lot of wonderful time lapse videos, right? Mm -hmm. Tough for lessons because you don't know what's going on. If you understand these concepts, you start to see what's going on and you can paint along with those without difficulty. All right. There was a last one. Is it how to lighten? How to lighten. So here's the thing. It takes very little of a color to tint your white, right? So let's say I put some white out here and I want to lighten my blue. I don't want to bring a lot over. It's easy for me to, I know this is a silly thing to explain. But if you don't know it, you don't know it. It's easy for me to darken. It would be hard for me to lighten this blue. I would have to use a lot of white. Look how much white I'm having to use to lighten the blue. It takes very little for me to darken. So when I'm trying to lighten paint, say I have a, a third color, a green, mm -hmm. and I want to lighten that green. I'm not going to take my white to the green and mix it in. And I'll show you why. I'll compare the two. So let's say I took my white to my green and I mixed it in. 
right? I've used a lot of paint, one. It took a lot of white to lighten it. But if I take a small amount, say I just want a tinted amount of it, I take it over to the white, I can have much more control. I can get little bits of it. See how much more control I have over the lightening process? Yes. Okay. So you don't want to take your white to your color that you're lightening. You want to take small amounts of color to your white. I know that's a crazy thing to explain, but it is a problem. And if you don't know it, you don't know it. Hmm. All right. Let's dry everything so it doesn't get away from me. You do the dry. And maybe I could get some fresh water and a coffee warm-up? I'm sure we could probably do something like that in the live lesson because that's what we do in the live is we multitask, right? Thank you guys for joining us. I do see everyone out there. It's really nice to see. I uh, see Elba and Corey and Lubella and Terry and Karen and someone earlier. I thought it was so funny. They, someone said, what? They're asking questions about what's going on. I love seeing you guys just chat, chat, chat. Thank you. Hello, Lindsay. Hello, Phyllis. Hello, everybody. Okay, I'm back. You're back. Yes, I'm back. Okay. I'm going to flip my canvas around so that I have a nice area to work and I'm not dragging my hand through paint. Remember to move your canvas, not your body. And um, we'll do water and the coffee. Uh, yes, so we got, do we need to move on to the uh, next? Are painting we, techniques. Painting techniques. I'll monologue like a villain for a minute and then we'll get into it. Monologuing like a villain. Okay, guys, so painting techniques. I have some techniques you've kind of been introduced to, like dry brushing. You saw the load for dry brushing, but how to use that load in a painting might be confusing. Um, you know, you've got to be able to make an even background when you start out painting. You've got to be able to dry brush. You have to understand how to layer acrylic paint. Um, the word would be like, uh, sometimes in all prima where everything is wet or how to layer it when everything is dry and when you need to use that. You need to know when to glaze. Those are transparent colors. You need to know when to be painterly and expressive. And you need to know when you need your lines and your contour and your brush direction. Now, blending, I'm going to put in a whole different segment because blending is really hard in acrylics. That's probably for acrylic one of the areas that everybody struggles. And we're going to go through that in its own section. But first, we're going to cover those primary painting techniques. And the 10 paintings we're going to do in the class, it's going to be based on the techniques that you're learning today. So if you're wanting to do those 10 paintings coming up, these are the techniques that you want to be kind of comfortable with. Remember, you can warm up before every painting. You can practice techniques before every painting. And I'm going to try to talk about the techniques that we're going to use in a painting so you understand what we're referring back to. Um, let me go and see if I can take a question from the lab while John is gone. And that way you guys are not the boarded. I'm going to turn my volume down so that uh, my channel. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And here I am kind of live as you are. All right. Will these beginning videos be in a mini book, says Coney Houston. Yeah, they will be in a mini book. Beginning videos will be in a mini book. How do I prevent blob my blob? My paint is, how do I prevent blob? My paint is transparent. I think that, uh, yeah, that may be a question about the, your, if you're, I was going to ask that if your paint is sticky and getting blobby, is that more likely to be the paint, not the. So what's happening in your paint if it starts to become sticky or blobby is it's beginning to dry and cure. Ah. And the environment in your studio may be too dry. And your paint may be prone to drying out quicker. Um, and I've got some fixes for that at the end of the video. That's a good question. Oh, we do, we still doing an even background? We're going to go. Yeah, I was just letting you have a minute to get there. We're going to go. Let me get back into my form. So I'm oh. on the, um, we are working our notes together today so we don't get lost. So you guys have this like boom, 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 little Shh. organized class. Is it? We have. Even we have background. Graphics. Backgrounds. You got to be able to paint them. You got to be able to paint an even background. Seems like that should be easy. Isn't always an easy thing to do. Yes. Some of that is about the load. All right. I'm going to switch this dirty water out for this clean water. 
Because again, paint water management, right? So I'm controlling the amount of water on my brush. We have a yellow here, so let's pull out a blue. You want to be able to paint a background where the paint is even. What you're looking to do is to cover all of the canvas with a color. You don't want mm -hmm. pops of canvas showing through. You're looking to completely cover it. You see on the outer edge here, it's kind of like open up to the underneath in here. And we want to cover all the white. Sometimes our canvas resists that. We talked about that and everything you need to know about canvas and some fixes for that. But that's what you're fighting. All right. Sometimes you will want to do like a, a compound color in the background, right? Which is maybe two or three colors mixed, not just one color. So you've got to be able to either mix enough of that color at the beginning. All right, I'm going to actually take this into a brighter color that you can really see. Let's get an orange going. All right. You've either got to make enough orange at the beginning to do all of the background that you have, or you're going to need to be very confident and confident at remixing that value. That's why this class, we're not only doing secondaries and not deep tertiaries. And we'll explain in the color mixing class what those terms mean. But what that means is, is that you've got to get good at mixing colors and mixing them consistently so that you can make a background that isn't patchy. You know, if I wasn't good at that, right, and I had some like this, you know, some like this, mm -hmm. and maybe too much white, right, I wouldn't have a uniform background. I have to be able to mix the same color again and again and again if I want a uniform single color background. Huh. A lot of people just go to the tube of paint. They just find the paint and the color they want. But you can really save money if you get better at just mixing your, your colors. And again, we're going to do that in the color mixing class that's on Saturday. We have a brush stroke class between us and that. All right. So even background, it's a weird thing to cover. But honestly, if you were having trouble with it, if you were feeling frustrated, you are not alone. Right? Where's that even background going wrong? You may be having trouble consistently mixing the same color or making a plan, making a strategy of mixing enough of the color to go through the whole painting when you need it. All right. Dry brushing. Let me dry my canvas so I can do some dry brushing. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to grab my <laughs> hair dryer. So, this is going to be an in-depth video where we cover quite a few different techniques. As you can see, those first painting techniques are pretty important which is what we're about to cover a little bit more of. And you can clearly see that I was not prepared with notes on what to talk about while she was hair dry. But luckily she's done. So here we go. I'm done. I'm always done. All right. Let's put out a little wet paint so you can kind of see. Do you need wet paint for dry brushing? Well, no, but I want to show you when it's gone wrong. You can use dry paint to dry brush? Okay. Stop. <laughs> I won't, don't put, I'm putting out this wet paint to to demonstrate a concept to you. Okay. I'm going to take a little of my yellow and I'm going to make some green. Some thoroughly mixed green. Now to make that paint, it's a little bit too wet for dry brushing. So I've got to make it and dry out my brush with a towel. If your paint's wet enough to mix the paint, it's too wet to do the dry brush. Now yeah. I've got my brush dry. So so you can kind of see it. All right. The first thing about dry brushing is my pressure has to be light. And the surface underneath has to be dry. See how that is? Yeah. If I take my dry brushing into wet paint, it starts to blend. That's pretty cool. So what you need to know is when you're dry brushing, dry brushing works on a dry surface. And that your brush needs to be dry. And if you've been mixing paint, it may be holding secret water, messing up your dry brushing. Secret water. You need a drier brush for craft paint 
than you do for heavy body paint. Heavy body paint has an easier time doing dry brushing because it's already pretty heavy in the body. Craft paint's got a lot of moisture in it, so you're going to want to do your driest brush and your driest surface and your lightest pressure to get the technique. All right, layering. So in paint, we have to layer paint, right? We huh. have to layer paint to create value and shading and, and, and to create depth and dimension. But when we layer and how we layer is very important. Now, when our paint is dry, pretty easy to layer on there, isn't it? Mm. Come right in. However, we can layer, right? I'm going to get a pretty thick load over our wet paint. If it's still really wet and your pressure increases, it starts to become a blend on the canvas. Ah. So this is wet and this was wet, but by light pressure, I was able to keep the white paint wet, like white on top of the red paint. I pressed too hard. I got pink paint. So this is the challenge of a la prema, whether you're doing it in oils or acrylics, painting went into wet, um, is that if you want the color to sit on top, you can't press very hard. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Explaining that. Okay. The other thing about layering. Hmm. It would be tough to come up on this very thick white paint and get a good layer. See how it picked up the, the white? Yeah. So I can layer wet into wet over a thin coat, but I will start to see intermixability as soon as I go over very thick wet. Definitely. Stuff to know that will happen. This is an issue for you as a beginner because as I'm teaching and I'm using terminology, a term can mean many things in a single process or technique on the canvas. Knowing what's happening in your own painting keeps you in that Goldilocks zone. Shall we glaze? I think we shall. We should. We should glaze. So glazing is a transparent and thin co coat of color, right? Mm -hmm. And that's where there's a color underneath and the paint is so transparent on top, the color underneath is coming through and showing through. Now, some pigments are naturally transparent and sometimes you have to thin the pigment to help it be transparent. The red here, primary colors are often pretty transparent, but sometimes I'm going to just demonstrate thinning it so you know that that's what we're doing. I come here. Notice that as I paint the thin glaze of red here, right, it almost visually looks orange. Oh, yeah. Because it's thin and transparent? Because it's thin and transparent. It's like having little cellophane sheets uh, next to each other. I'm going to grab some of my blue, thin and transparent. Green. Here's where glazing bites you in the butt. Sorry, is that okay? Whoop. Patootie. It. Well, you already went there. <laughs> already went there. I'm sorry. It got gotcha. you. Bum bum. If someone's gonna get bit, it's gonna be you. It's that serious. We come here. So what happens to a lot of people is they're painting student paints. It's more economical paints. They're painting colors that are naturally transparent and they want to do something like have a dark green background with a yellow flower on top can we get in that and see that Oops, i'll do that see. again right i'm oh. trying to paint little loose yellow flowers on top but what do i see is that look brightly yellow no it looks no. kind of greenish looks kind of greenish so what i have to do is recognizing when my paint is glazing because I want it to, which I showed you earlier, but when in my paint is glazing when I don't want it to. When it's glazing when I don't want it to, what I have to do is take a bit of white. Just get a bit of white so you can really see it happen. And maybe I'll even kind of intermix it here and then we'll dry it and then you'll see me do it and you'll be like, what? Okay. Pretty good, right? Yeah. Now we're going to dry that. When I come back, I'm going to show you the difference of the yellow. Could be red. Could be many other colors. 
but the yellow between the yellow over the blue where it's transparent and the yellow over the white when you made this step. So let's try it. Okay. Little quick dry dry. I think. Okay, let's see. All right. Everybody here today, if you chose to be here today, you chose to have a better painting experience. You made that choice. This moment here, if nothing else makes your painting experience oh. better, this moment here will. It's a different yellow, isn't it? How much brighter are these yellows that are glazed over the white than these yellows glazed over the green? Wow. Sometimes this is the difference. You know, I'll say to people, you, you know, uh, there are professional artists that paint with student paints. Uh -huh. The difference would be is that artist just knows to put the white underneath. They adjust to the reality of the paint. Your paint isn't good or bad. Your paint has a temperament. It has qualities. It binds easily. It doesn't bind easily. It dries slowly. It dries too fast. It's a little transparent. It's got a These personality. Are... You need to get to know. Yeah, your paint has a personality in your studio. Oh, yeah, and everybody's paint behaves differently in everybody's studio because acrylic paint is so impacted by humidity and temperature, conditions of, of, the, of the studio. So even if we have the same products and the same everything, you may be having a different experience than I am. All right, glazing. Guess what we get to do now, John? You. We get to be painterly and expressive. You guys want to be expressive? You were, can you, I was like, I thought we had already glazed. We, we glazed. Did. We're now on to being painterly. Painterly and expressive. How's everybody doing? Good. I now, I, even though we're live and I'm hoping the mods are getting your questions and I'm going to go through and what we'll do is we're going to try to collect the questions. And then I'm, we're going to answer them over on the Facebook Q&A live. Yeah, Cindy was just asking that. Like, yeah. I got in here late. How long after the show can I ask questions? Like, all the way through. Mods are going to try to get it. We're going to go to Facebook. And as long as Sony Entertainment has turned down its <laughs> content ID craziness, we uh -huh. should have a Facebook Live that goes just fine. <laughs> it's just... Even if it gets us and you guys get booted out, um, I counterclaim in about seven days it's released because... I don't actually use any video game footage or music in my videos. Nope. Mm -mm. So the claim is crazy. Okay. Painterly and expressive. Let's switch over to say, I'm going to get into my number four just to show you guys this. Now, in the world, I'm going to go here. In the world, sometimes we have very smooth brush strokes, right? Smooth. And then sometimes we have these loosely mixed, expressive, energetic brush strokes. Now, there's an artist that we're all very familiar with. It's kind of known for his expressive way of painting things. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm doing curved strokes that are open and staggered. I'm not being neat and tidy. Right? I'm trying to just let them be paint. You can see that they're paint. Let's get a little more orange into it. And coming around the toe, I'm weaving back in. It's kind of a linear paint impression. Notice that the brush strokes are not organized into tidy little rows. They're not. I'm not rowing them up. I wonder if you guys already know what we're doing. How many I people know I what we're doing? <laughs> so this artist really made a whole career of this expressive, impressionistic process of painting. And painted the night sky in this way. Characteristics of this style of painting are, again, brush strokes that are sort of free and and not regimented, right? Often you're using the brush in a very light methodology. Right? You're not pre putting a lot of pressure on it. There's a free spiritedness about it. Mm -hmm. Have they identified it? Have they guessed? What I do you think guys so. Guessed? 
All right, someone's coming. I've around. guessed. Now, when we first started that, this, this oh, way yeah. of painting, right? Charity guessed it. Did you guess it? Right. When I'm being, you know, expressive with something and painterly, I might be energetic. Notice that my brush is energetic. Uh -huh. Some black into here. It's very energetic. Right? That would be an expressive way of painting. Going from a like a dry brush and everything into that. Versus When you're doing something maybe that is considered oh, yeah. and slow and methodical, you might go over those areas the same time. Would you say that this is about lines? Not yet. Oh, no. Okay. No, Just we're talking sure. about expressive and painterly. And sometimes okay. I like to show the opposite of that. I just want to make sure I'm not okay. like, you know, this is unrehearsed. We have no net. All right now, when it's there's white showing through, it's kind of expressive and painterly. But when I'm making an effort to control things and be tidy, right? I might not be painterly. This would be painterly. Hmm. I'm just telling you this so that when you are painting with someone and they use that term, what kind of action are they expecting of you at home? Oh, yeah. Right? What are they asking of you? So that's what painterly and expressive would be about. I'm going to turn my surface again. Let's work on some lines. We can do that. New water soon. So demanding. All right. Lines. Got to be able to make lines with all your brushes. So the first thing I'll tell you, when I'm doing my round brush, I'm going to come over here and bring some water. And notice that I'm thinning it and swirling it and rolling it. That's because I'm going to have better lines from a fluid paint. Now, you could have separate paint. Many artists do. I'm going to load to the toe of the brush lines. Let's say I'm going to line this. How fine a line is flying along here. I have this little drip and let's say I want to line it. And how thick something is would be entirely about how hard I'm pressing. Mm, okay. Oh, we'll wait for John for the side view because he's giving me fresh water. Fresh water. Clean. We'll go over it again. So if I have a brush and I press very hard, look at that line. That's not a good line. I just also broke the heel of my brush, didn't I? Now, I might want a line that was sort of thick and even like that. Right? But if I want fine lines, I'm going to have to lighten up. I'm going to want to light load at my toe. Yeah. Well, not not I don't actually break my brushes. I know how to push it to the to the limit and not break it. Notice how fine that that line is. I find that um much like have you guys ever done a thing where you remember the old timey cameras where you would like click it but the film speed uh was like <laughs> slow enough that you kind of had to hold your breath <laughs> so that you were a little bit more like a tripod. There's a lot of things that we can do to improve the steadiness of our line. Sometimes holding our breath, even though I don't encourage that in painting in general, but even steadying your breath and slowing down. You're not going to get fine lines going fast. Notice that my overall painting speed has slowed. 
my breathing will slow down. The pressure in my hand will slow down. Everything lightens and mellows. Right, then, 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 swirling, swirling, roll, roll. The reason I thin and roll is to pull the paint from the belly down towards the toe more so that it's not creeping up the ferrule. Thick, thinner, thick, thinner, right? Now, if I wish to have a thick, uh, a line that's like kind of going from a thick area to a point, which we do for petals, we do for all kinds of things. I could do an upward brush stroke. I can even pull it down. If I go fast in my line making and I randomize it, what starts to happen. Notice that my fingers are moving, flicking forward. I'm up the brush, controlling it. I'm not in the back being expressive and painterly. I'm up front. You should be able to do solid work and fine work on the same thing. Look, we're dry brushing and doing little tiny lines. You should have this type of versatility. In your work. If I'm pretending to kind of like write in calligraphy and I'm doing compound lines, a lot of lines are an S stroke. See that? That is fine lines and uh, thick lines and how you get your brush to give you thicker, thinner. You can do that on your, you can, if you're going to do a line on a bright, let me just show you real quick. If you need a line on a bright, if you go on the flat, that's a pretty thick, wide line, right? You go on the edge. My mic was off. That's finer. Those are some lines. You can even paint with the corner. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's what's happening there. I'm going to dry my canvas and we're going to come back and I'm going to paint a pair and show you contour. <laughs> okay. Paint a pair and contour. That's a good thing to do because pairs have contours. They're not square. Because you wouldn't want to eat a square pear. Although I hear square watermelons are quite popular in small refrigerators. Which makes a lot of sense. But we're here to paint. So I should probably not wax philosophical about fruits and vegetables. So let us go before the carrots get us. Okay, she's taking longer than I thought that. Okay, I've okay. run out of dad puns. We gotta you run out of dad puns. Gotta move on. You're from an the drawing. infinite dad punner. How can you run out of dad puns? It's been Where many late nights. Where did my round just go? Did I drop it on the floor? What did you drop? I feel like I dropped my round brush, but I couldn't tell you where. Um, the round brush. Is it on the floor? I don't know. I'll come look. Can you look. I'll look. I don't see it on the table. All right. But I was drawing vigorously. Oh, there it is. It's in my lap. Don't laugh. It's okay. Laugh. It's not behind you. So what are we on contour? We're going to do contour. Let's do some contour. All right. Let's do some contour. So let's say, you know, I'm painting along and I'm going to paint a little pear here. Pear like little kidney bean shape. We'll start with yellow. Pears are interesting little creatures. Anytime you paint them, they have so many colors and so much personality. Get some blue and yellow into it to kind of make some green. Let's have some green pear this time. 
doing little kind of stippled short strokes here to kind of imply the texture on the pair yeah. that we're doing. This is also sort of covering brush directionality, which we'll do in a second. I guess I'll get back into it with a ball. But you can kind of see the shape of that little pair kind of yeah. coming up, right? Got a pear-y shape. Kind of got a pear shape. We're going to take a little bit of our orange. I'll go a little more into the yellow. You know. I'll get into my green. Not a banana. Not a banana? Are you sure? It might pass as a squash if you squinted. A little stem here. We'll be artful. We'll give it little dots and everything for some texture. You know, we want our pair to be, have a little personality of some kind, I suppose. Contour lines. So when you paint an object and just its value, its texture, its shape, and its form, um, you're, you know, you're expressing that through a lot of different atmospheric techniques. When you think of contouring and going around lines, a lot of times we think of that in terms of comic. Uh -huh. Art, but that's when we anchor something with a structural line, right? So, notice that I'm kind of going around this object, and notice it became a stronger art piece. For the use of the line. Because I use contour lines, it's lines that are going around it to express it. I know, it's a thing. I unlock my own thing. Oof. When it does this, it just makes it so mad. But it doesn't recognize my face with makeup, so <laughs> I need to do something about that. <laughs> All right, so we've done contour. We've just got to talk brush direction now. That's a bumper. Did you have it? Oh, the uh, brush direction. Yes, mm -hmm. sorry. I didn't. Oh, no, it's okay. You want that. All right, let's come up into our yellow. Brush direction tells us a lot about an object. I am going to try to imply that something has kind of a curved shape. The directionality of my brush strokes can kind of imply that for me. All right? It would be tough to paint a curved shape if all the lines are straight. Uh huh. You know? When you're painting water, you have to have a very thoughtful brush direction because depending on whether the water is in motion or flat or light's going to be reflecting across it, those brush directions or implied line or implied texture can tell your eye a lot about what could be happening in a particular painting. The direction of these brush strokes around the star down here, if we can go over to the Van Gogh star, There, it is. there we go. Notice how that curving energy implies a radiation of light out, right? Yeah. When we curve the brush strokes on this pair, that implies that the bottom of the pair has a round shape, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. So on top of the color value hue technique that we're using, just the directionality of a technique, um, can be really, really impactful. Uh, I don't know, I'll do something. You can almost feel a wave happening here as the brush strokes change their curve and direction. Hmm. You feel the wave? I do, I see it. Yeah. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about brush direction. Oh my goodness. Best. So much so. still to do. Fresh water. We got to come back and work on blending. We're Let's working see. so hard today. You guys are working so hard. So, you think 
Blending. We're now ready for some blending. blending. Acrylic painting and blending. This is the reason acrylic paint um, is a challenging medium to blend because it dries really quickly. And once it's properly cured and dried, it doesn't really lift up. I can't come and reactivate this orange once that orange is dry. So let's talk about blending. I'll use my um, angle brush here. All right, blending. Let's talk about wet into wet blending. The bumper. I just did. Ah, okay, I don't so, know. More We've been really rushed, and so John's been just like going, going, going since midnight. More bumper. All right, let's blend from a yellow to a blue. Oh, let's go over here. Sure. I've got my yellow paint here. And then I'm good. And I want to blend to a blue. Well, I'm going to want to maybe mix a half tone, right? A green half tone. And then as I come between this wet paint and this wet paint, I'm going to very lightly stroke to help blend. Sorry. What? Nothing. Oh. Nothing. It's all fine. <laughs> I just pushed the wrong button. All right, I'm going to try to blend there. And so this paint and that paint only blend. I'm getting the extra paint off of this because they're both wet. I am blending in the direction of the stroke, not against it, because that would just bring this green all the way through the yellow. As I go through, I could come into the blue. Brushing into that and blending it in. I'll wipe off all my towel because I don't want too much paint on here, especially as I go in to the more delicate color, the yellow. Oh, yeah. Okay, I can blend into those colors. You can also take a soft dry brush if you want to soften any blend. Right, that's just the basic tenets of blending. Now, I gotta get up to, all right. That's like working it that direction. Let's talk a little bit uh, blending the right way, blending the wrong way, just to All demo right. that again. Ready? Right way. So the right way, if I want to blend from a light color to a dark color, I'm going to go white, and then I'm going to have some dark red. I'll come from the darker color to the lighter color in the direction. softening my pressure as I go. See how it just creates that soft transition. Mm -hmm. I can go from the light color into the darker color. But what I shouldn't do is go from this red all the way back through the white because I'll start to carry that color and I can lose control over the blend. I can always add more dark color to the outer edge or more light color to this outer edge, but what I don't want to do is work that middle with just a light color or just a dark color. Mm -hmm. I want to work from the outer edge so that I'm constantly transitioning. Right? So let's come back before this dries and say the wrong way. Okay. The wrong way. The wrong way to blend is when I blend the opposite direction from the transition. So if I have a vertical transition from light to dark, I don't want to blend horizontally because it's going to take away all my color. If I have, say, a light color to a darker color going horizontally, I'm gonna make one here. You see that where it's blending into the white? Yeah. Becoming softer and softer and softer. 
horizontally, if I try to blend that vertically, it goes away. So you have to blend in the direction of your transition. If you have a vertical transition, you have to blend vertically. If you have a horizontal transition, you're blending wet into wet horizontally. Mm. If you go against your transitional direction, you're gonna lose your, your soft blend. All right. Now let's do linear blending. Linear blending. Okay. So linear blending is good for beginners to know about because sometimes um, the challenges of the old masters painting with like egg tempera or gouache, mm -hmm. which are not really blendable materials, can help you in a medium that has many of the same challenges. So when I want to do a linear blend, I'm going to want to mix three values. So if I'm going to go from yellow to like a blue green, I'm going to want to take some yellow and then make a half tone. Right. And then have, you know, my blue green tone there. I'm going to mist my palette, by the way. We're going to talk about this as a way to keep things going on your thing. Let's do it here. Okay. So first I'll take uh, I'm just yellow and I'm going to make little lines. And we're going to be doing a horizontal. This will be line directional dependent too. Okay. All right. And I'll come down and you'll notice as I come down, I open up those lines, don't I? Mm -hmm. Why do you do that? So that I can weave in the midtone. Oh, okay. Right? Because they don't really blend together as much as optically interweave. And I'm doing this pretty open. This is a pretty big stroked linear blend. But if you look at uh, frescoes, if you look at um, uh, old Madonnas that were done in egg tempera, what you'll notice is this is how everything was blended. Right, and maybe come up here. Now, as I get up into the area where I want to go into light, my strokes become lighter and less frequent. So now I've got this sort of yellow to this blue I mean this green, and I'm gonna come down into a darker green. This is not the fastest method. This is one that's really terrific for water though, guys. Sky effects. Anytime you're having a really hard time going from another color to another color, like where they're contrast and they're just not giving you a break. Mm -hmm. This is a good way to maybe get that break. You can always come back and transition it. Nice. See how that goes? Yeah. The linear blending. All right. Last one, I've got to make three stripes and then dry them. So let me do that here since I've got some color out already. I'm going to make this stripe. What happens to a lot of you is that your paint is drying on you faster than you're getting your uh, blends able to happen. So you end up with three distinctive stripes. I'll dry that and talk about how you fix it. So how, okay. John's got to get up there. I'm, I'm in what? the wrong location. Oh, am I? Yeah. Which one were you at? Here. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> So we had a smooth transition blend there, but we're talking about, have you guys ever had a thing where you're trying to paint with me, paint with anybody, and you were going through several colors and it was like you had a stripe and a stripe and a stripe, circular stripe, circular stripe, circular stripe. It was just clear zones. It's not a transition. It's not a blend. I'm going to dry so, this. You, yep. um, and, and it's dry, right? That's why dry, I'm drying dry. it. Because you no longer have the option to wet into wet blend. Something happened. You had to walk away. Paint was drying any fast, but it got dry and you don't have the blend anymore. Okay. I think we're going to do that. All right. Okay. So here we go. Here we go. Now this is how to fix. Striped blend. Striped blend. Okay. Just want to make sure that we. Yeah, were how on. to fix a striped blend. You've gotten a striped blend. Gush darn it. First. Repair from the lightest side. 
So I'm going to start with my yellow. And look, I'm going to glaze back. Now it's a glaze. And then I'll come and maybe get a little of my green. And I'm blending it back into where I know the blue is going to be. In other words, my lightest color towards my darkest color yeah. that's in my blend. doesn't really matter what it is. Back to the blue. And come back towards the middle. Softly. Not heavy pressure, soft pressure. I got a little too much dark. And because the paint underneath is dry, I can actually lift up. Huh. I can clean up with this because it's dry underneath. So even if I have three stripes, if I just let my paint dry or it is dry, I can go back and in a combination of glazing and blending, correct it and sometimes end up with an even better transition. This mistake often becomes the best sky possible. Da, 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 da. Aren't you guys loving it? I think this is pretty fantastic. Hopefully y'all feel like you're just learning all the deets. This is, this is deetful. This is totally. All right. Mmm. Full <sighs> of those deets. How to deal with common mistakes and problems. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It should be and problems, but I didn't type it, so. It's common mistakes and problems. All right, one of the things that's happening, now I have a wet palette, so this does slow down the drying of my paint, but maybe I'm on a paper plate, maybe I'm in a different situation. I want to have a mister bottle. Mist the paint. Not a lot of water. You don't want big droplets. You don't want it soaked. You don't want to change how your paint's mixing if you have to dry brush. You just want to create a light mist on the surface of your paint so it doesn't skin. Mm. So you can have a wet palette or you can have a mister. I have both. It really does help. All right. Let's do the next mistake. The next mistake? Yes. Getting up too soon. <gasps> oh, no. So for most of you, the biggest problem you have in your painting, and I have seven years of experience in looking at thousands of paintings of a Facebook group of 50,000 people in it who share I don't know, 400 to 700 paintings a day. Mm -hmm. And I'm in there all the time checking to see what's going on because as a teacher, that's my job. Um, your biggest mistake is you give up too soon. Yeah, You get frustrated, you get overwhelmed, you start to think that there's some fundamental thing that you're not getting, and you're really about two-thirds of the way done with a painting, but paintings have a very long, ugly stage. Often. Mm have just a tremendously long ugly stage a stage for which you have to have faith it's all going to work out yep and you guys give up before you're almost done it's like you did two-thirds of the marathon and then just thought there was no ending and went home and then you have partially completed canvases everywhere so my advice to you is one of the biggest things to help you in that beginning thing is finish it finish it when you don't like it finish it when you do like it the learning and the growth happens through the journey, through the process, through the connective skills that come together in a painting, through your ba brain realizing, oh, if I layer it this way, that's how I get the effect. Yep. Your brain cannot make the realization if it doesn't go through the process. you got to do the painting. That makes sense. So that's a big mistake that beginners make. You guys give up too soon. All right. Let's do another one. All my mistakes. Muddy paint. So there's muddy water and muddy paint, and a lot of times paint starts to get um, muddy. And I'm going to do the quick way to make paint muddy is to mix primaries together. So I'm going to make an orange. Okay. You guys see that there? That is a muddy paint color. There's no amount of yellow. Oh, wait. Oh, yeah, you can see it. All right, let's put it here. Let me go over there. Okay. I'm going to do this actually on the canvas so you can see this happening. All right. So say I'm painting and I'm like, oh, there's some yellow. And then I'm like, oh, there's some red. That's looking pretty good. 
but I accidentally get some blue in there and it starts to go muddy. Uh-huh. I'm not going to make this paint less muddy by adding more to it. When you see your paint go muddy, you're going to want to stop and do one of the two corrections for mistakes that I have going on. You're going to want to clean it while the underneath painting is dry or you're going to want to allow it to dry and start over. Um, if you find that your paint has gone muddy, stop. Wash out your brush. Wipe it off. You're going to want to evaluate your palette. Is your paint becoming muddy because your palette has gotten messy? Is it just that there's no clean place for you to mix the color? So you're getting red, yellow, and blue in the same mix every time. Does that, do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You need to recognize, don't be so wrapped up in this that you miss that it happened here. When you see this, you stop and you go, what has happened? Is it in my brush? Did I not rinse out my brush well enough between paint colors? Is it on my palette? Right? Was the surface underneath not dry? Was that paint coming up? So I was putting an orange over a green and I didn't realize the green wasn't dry and it went and made muddy paint. So you want to recognize what failure in the paint process and technique is creating the paint. Don't continue to play with the muddy paint. <laughs> Unless you like mud. <laughs> You're looking for mud. Then by all means lean in. And notice there's two kinds of mud, right? And you might intentionally mix one of these colors because you need a brown. But if you're not trying to get them, right, you're not going to get to a bright purple from here. You're not going to keep adding red and blue and white to get to a bright purple from mud. All you can do for yourself is recognize how the mud happened, stop the problem, and start over. Mm. Not the whole painting, just the, in the technique process, little part of the painting that you're in, you would start over. Not the whole painting. Um, all right, next one. Okay. Dirty water. Other place that you accidentally dull your colors is in the water. If you're not changing your water, the pigment that's in the paint is now in the water floating free. It would be very hard and very dirty water to get a bright white, a bright yellow, a bright blue, red, any of it. These pigments count. And when the water, I mean, like, this is pretty fine. These are pretty fine. But when they turn into the murk, mm -hmm. you got to stop. So if it looks like Swamp Thing can live in there, you got to stop. All right. You ready for the next one? I think it is. I think this is still wet enough to do this. And I'm sorry to do this to you, but I had to find one to do it. Where are you going to do it at? We're going to, I'm going to do it over here because I think it's still wet. Okay. And I might paint it some more so it is still wet since I've already done it. And, and this is that. Remove a hair. No. This huh? is the hidden water damage. Uh-oh. I can do that here too. I know. Right. Next one is remove okay. a hair. So sometimes you forget to uh, wipe off your brush. Doop, doop, doop. And before everything slides, it does that. And we're going to let that um, have a thing. I can't wipe that away if the paint is wet without lifting the paint. So I have to dry it and allow it to dry the paint over it. Right, And if I have a dark color and a light color, because the water drop removed all the paint underneath, to so say like this degree, I can't just come back. Let me dry this and show you. Okay. Just a quick dry. I can't just come back with another color. Because the two tones are going to show. You're going to have to do a couple of layers. You're going to have to like take, I'll, I'll take a little white and yellow. Do, do, do. Just a couple of little dry layers. I think she just wants to get it completely dry so that it can make, there it is. Okay. Multi-layer. Two layer effects. 
So that happens when your paint isn't fully cured and you get a water drop or spill or splatter or something where you don't expect it to be. All right. Uh, now, now, are we going to do the... Now, I think we can move in to... To remove a hair. Remove a hair. I'll go ahead and do some loosely mixed uh, blue and white. See if I can find it again. Have you ever been painting? And, and I'm sorry to do this to you. I just want you to see how it goes. And then the hair gets in the paint. I need a better hair. Does we have a pet hair? <laughs> Our hairs are just... I need a pet hair. I don't know. I can sure... Where's the Twix? Maybe I can pull one out of one of these. I have one that's new enough to pull it from. Sometimes you can get one out of a new brush. I need a Twix. My brushes are not shedding. Your enough. brushes are not shedding? I buy, buy quality brushes. Oh, what am I, I think. thinking? And we need it with the paint to be wet. I'm just going to show you how to remove the hair. Twix. We need a hair. Pet hair. Does she have any hair? No, she doesn't. Why is there no hair? Yeah, here you go. She's not, though. She's nothing. It's getting in there. Oh, my gosh. I'll put this here. All right. Let's say hair got in there. I don't know if you can see it. I hope you can see it. You're painting, and there's a hair. Okay. There you go. You can there see you it. Go. I can see it. All right. Shh. You don't want a hair that's everywhere in your studio. You do have, you just you do need a hair. It's nowhere. So when I want to remove a hair and it's in there, I come in with a brush and I use it to pick it up. I'm just saying that because in seven years, every time I fixed it, they were like, how'd you do that? I just come in with the brush and pick it up. And then if I have to smooth anything out, I can do that then. All right. There's remove your a hair. And I'm going to show you wet paint fix and dry paint fix. Let's see here. Wet paint. Dry paint. All right. So, I'm painting along. I'm going to do this like real quick. So, I have it like this. Right? And. I don't know what happened. I went, ah, oh, this paint is wet and this paint is wet. I have to dry it to fix it. Did we okay. do wet or dry first? Uh, this is wet paint, fix. wet paint fixes. Okay. So you guys see that? This paint was wet and this paint was wet and I boo-booed it. To fix a mistake that you make in wet into wet, right, you need to dry. Okay. That'll just take a brief moment for her to dry that down, and I'll make sure we're zoomed in on it so we can see what's going on. All right. All right. Now, hopefully you guys have been paying attention enough to this class that you know I can't just paint right over that, can I? That's too much of a contrast for the repair. I can take red and a little bit of white. I'm using the opacity of the white and the tinting strength of the red. Now I don't have too big of a transition in color between my red and my background. All right, that's much more hidden, isn't it? Dry it. And just a quick dry to make sure. I say that, you know, I don't really know how long she'll dry, but I think it won't be too long because it's just a thin layer of paint, right? That's right. Not too long. Okay. When you dry to fix, sometimes colors that look like they are fixed will suddenly reveal themselves. There's a, there's an induced discoloration from the substructure. Mm. Okay. So you do the same technique. Now I'm going to go a little darker, closer to my color that's in the background on this next coat. This also works on restoring furniture and walls and things like that. This is a good skill. Knowing how to fix something like super crazy mm -hmm. is a very good skill. So 
I'm going to dry it. I'm going to look to see how much it's showing through. Okay. Might have to have another layer. Till you cannot see. You just keep adding underneath. layers. Yeah. You just go on layers, and I'll just do this because we're here for a thing. And then mm. you do your coat again, that color that you wanted. Right? So you just go and go and go till it doesn't show through. Yep. Takes three to four coats, really. But I'm giving you the basic idea of the process. And this is the worst catastrophic thing. This is Sharpie. This is, this is you did a black streak through an area that you had a light thing. This is how you get that back. Now I want to come back and show you how you can fix a mistake over dry paint. Okay. Let's see. Fix a mistake over dry paint. Techniques you need to have. Okay. This one's my favorite. Yeah. Easiest to do. All right. I'm painting along. And I'm going, woo, oh, but I, I, all right, let's say you I took some black, right? There it goes. Oh, but I didn't want it there. I did not want it there. All right, I'm going to take clean water before it dries. This is dry paint fixing. Only if the paint underneath is cured and dry, which is why we went over when your paint is dry at the beginning. Every one of the concepts in this beginner technique class teaches you a core skill set that you have to have to get through your first challenges in your first couple of years as an artist. Ah. I've been here a minute, so I know what you guys are up against. I know what you guys are up against. I do. All now, right. That was pretty cool, right? That was pretty cool. So now we're going to cool. go, I guess, like, did you get the video to show the traceable thing? I think so. Okay. All right. I'm just making sure before we get there. Okay. All right. So we need to do drawing on a canvas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Drawing on the canvas. All right. So when you're painting, uh, and when you start out, when you're in the middle of the painting, doesn't really matter where you are, you will have the opportunity to need to sketch out structural or concept lines onto a surface. And there are a couple things I have to say about this. A lot of people are tempted to get their core pencil out. This is just a regular pencil. And I'm going to make some marks here. The issue with pencil. Let me get some pure wet. Right. Are we there? Yep. Is that when I paint my white over it, the pencil picks up pigment. The pigment of the graphite sinks through the white and stains what's above it. See that? And you can't remove it with water. So there's this problem. Now there's a fix. Sometimes people use a, a, a sploosh, a spritz of spray varnish to set the pencil. That's what you would see in all large do or some artists that are familiar with this problem. What I really ask beginners to do is just switch tools, right? Mm. Because there's so many steps to fixing this. I've said, hey, watercolor pencil or chalk. Let me show you chalk. All right. This is chalk. You can do chalk over the dry paint and the canvas, and it lets you make all kinds of important lines, right? So you could do anything that you needed to draw. More importantly, with clean water, you can easily lift, remove, or change the chalk, whereas the pencil did not this well. So if you have to do a sketch and then you want to take away your sketching lines, you can do that much easier. This particular tool is a tailoring tool for quilting and tailoring. It's a Dritz chalk tool. The reason I chose it is it has pure chalk as a cartridge. There's no wax. There's no oil. It's pure chalk. Um, it's, it's pure clay. It doesn't have additives in it. You could also use the chalk from a box of chalk, like on a chalkboard or mm -hmm. Crayola chalk or any of that. The other thing that I like to use is watercolor pencil. I like watercolor pencil. 
Today, earlier, someone said, how do you write wishes on the canvas? With a watercolor pencil. Happy painting. Tips about the watercolor pencil um, is that you pick a color that will work well with your background. So if I'm doing a blue sky, I would pick a blue watercolor pencil if what is going above it is predominantly blue or predom uh, brown if it's predominantly brown. I kind of think about that a little bit because there's pigment. Right, this is a Caron watercolor pencil, but any of them will do this. I can take water then and remove it. But you can see it does have pigment, but it is removable. Mm. So that is why I use those tools to sketch on a canvas. The last thing that you can sketch on a canvas with is paint. Whoops, that's not you. Let's see here. So if I were to come here and I'm I'm a little bit above you, yep. And I needed to sketch something out. Let's sketch out a happy face. Let's say we were painting a happy face over a colorful background. I can't, and it's a happy cat face. We're going to do that, right? I can sketch out those things, you know, with my paint. The thing is, is that when the paint dries, there's paint. Right. I do it all the time in landscapes because you need very few structural lines. And when I'm sketching, I'm not trying to sketch every detail that I see. I'm trying to sketch the basic outer contours. Remember contours from the pair? Yes. We're trying to do the contours, not every detail. O outside structural lines. What you think of for a coloring page, a very simple coloring page. That's why traceables are simple. Right. And whenever I get them too complicated, it just makes you all miserable. And I love when my patrons give me feedback because sometimes they get to see things early and then they're like, no, this did not work. Your intentions failed. <laughs> and I'm able to redo that traceable and make it more simple. So it's important to understand that it's not every line that you see in something. It is the lines that are necessary to hold the painting. You can't remove HB pencil easily and it can stay in the paint above it. I like watercolor, pencil, and chalk. These are not the only answers. They are just good answers. You cannot use crayon, oil pastel, or a colored pencil that is wax-based because the paint won't stick to it. All right. Good things to know. All right. The tracing method. Goodness gracious, this was a big class today. It really was. <laughs> tracing method. All right. Do we have that video? And I'll tell you when to play it. So okay. first, when you want to do a trace tracing method, you've got to find something to trace. I'm going to tell you about my website because I'm incredibly biased. Mm -hmm. So self-promotion here. So say you're doing this class with me and you want to do one of the 10 paintings. You don't want to draw. A, don't push it yet. I won't. You, you, uh, I'm going to show you guys how to draw everything in freehanded. But also I understand that not everyone is in that space. And I've been online a long time and I know that. Tracing is not cheating. It is a technique. They teach it in art school, transferring images. You have many ways you can do it. You can do gridding, you can do projection, you can do this transfer method. There's a lot of ways to get things on. So if you're choosing to do the, the traceable, which I will provide, you'd want to go to the Art Sherpa website and find the traceables module. It says traceable, so that's very, very helpful. Is it playing? There it goes. Okay, there it goes. So click the traceables module. Now on the traceables module, oh, no, I think you... Oh, there it is. Yes. You want to click the traceable that you want. It's going to open up, right? And it's a little tiny icon that lets you know to download it. I'm sorry for that. For some reason, icons can't be bigger. I don't know why the, t the website team can't explain it to me, right? This is me accidentally doing stuff, doing stuff that I'm not supposed to do. But I situate my traceable. Now, at this stage, you could check the size in your image editing files if you have Pixelmulator, Photoshop, or any of those, or Preview. I'm going to go to the printer, though, and I'm going to resize from the printer. So I went to select print, and I'm going to select scale. So one scale that I can do that makes all traceables pretty easy is fit to page. Right, scale to fit. But I can also percent scale it up and down, can't I? Mm -hmm. So I can do like fit to page was 59% of the size of the traceable. If I have 10, it makes it smaller. If I go to 100%, right, it would be bigger. So in that percentage, you can make it bigger or smaller to fit your uh, eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. 
And that can help you resize a traceable because sometimes, depending on where you get the reference, it could be bigger or smaller. Your downloading service might shrink things down and reduce their size. So what I have on the website may not be what you get in the home. It is in the printing segment and in the settings where you can constrain things and do them that um, you can change the size of a traceable. I just didn't know if you knew that and I wanted to show you that this was a possibility. If you need to enlarge a traceable, some printers have a poster feature on it um, or you can go to a website. It's going to say, it's going to sound like I'm saying a dirty word. I'm not. I hope I don't get tagged by YouTube. Raster Bader, R-A-S-T-E-R-B-A-R-T-E-R. The mods will type it in chat too. And that will let you resize a traceable. So once you've printed out the traceable, you're ready to transfer onto your canvas. Let's talk about that. Let's see here. Serial paper versus uh, watercolor pencil. Yes. I had to find the appropriate button. All right. So I have a product I really like, serial paper. It's this here. It's a transfer paper for art. Contains no wax or grease. Says so on there. Erases like pencil. Doesn't smear. Washes out of fabric. So it's good for fabric and art. Um, you can ink or pencil over the tracing and it won't skip and it's economical, can be used again and again and again and again. In other words, the sheet you cut for your traceable can be used for 50, 60 traceables. Mm. So, you're, so this is a one-time investment. Um, there's samplers and then there's rolls, but here's the truth. I like the yellow and I like the white. I found the blue and the red to be a little staining and have bleed through. This is just kind of like transfer, it's like copy paper. Right. The thing to know about this as we go, and I'm, let's say this is my printed out traceable here. Oh, look at that. Isn't that wonderful? It's a cat. It's a cat. And this is my serial paper that's been cut and it's been used before. Right. And I've got tape on it. I have low tack tape. Let's tape this down. Now on the serial paper, you're going to want to put it the colored side down. All right. And you're going to want to tape it in two places over where you're going to intend to transfer the image. If you don't want to use serial paper, you could use your watercolor pencil. You would want to take your pencil and rub, 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 rub. Right? Look at that. I'm taking the pigment from this pencil. Don, you want to see the rubbing? Let's see here. Oh, me. <laughs> I'm sorry, I was guys. looked away. Look All right. And we're going to rub, 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 leaving a transfer pigment from the pencil onto the paper. I'm going to want things to be taped in two places here as well. And the reason for that is, guys, is that if your traceable shifts, the line can shift on you. And the point is trying to get these outer important lines onto your surface, right? Now, serial paper works best if your canvas is completely cured, dry, and cool. Same with watercolor pencil. In fact, all tracing and transfer works better when your canvas is cured, cool, and dry, right? Cured, cool, and dry. Now, once it's cured, cool, and dry, I can come over and firmly press over the lines on my traceable to create a transfer. Okay, now I don't want to press so hard that I'm indenting the canvas. Ah. Because I can't get that out. If I press so hard on my pencil, I'm making a dent on my canvas or board or paper. That's permanent. So I need to find the Goldilocks zone of pressing down hard enough to get the image to transfer, but not so hard that I've done damage. If my canvas isn't wet, if my canvas is wet or is a little warm, it might also make an indent. So that's why those things are important. Ah. Now, I think it's a little hard. I might actually, you can kind of see the serial here. John gets in on it. Can you guys see the serial line here? Yeah. Usually yeah, that's a little crazy. Thin. I'm going to move down to some white so you can see the purple. Okay. So you can see how that would transfer out. So you can see how it does. It's pretty light and it will remove with water. Both of these remove with water. Mm. Um, I have also successfully used chalk on the back of paper. It is not a dark line. If you have visual issues with contrast, you're going to have to pick a method that leaves you a dark enough line. Okay. I can see the difference between even this crazy 
visually busy background and my yellow line to get my construct. And so I could come back in later. Yeah. If I had to like, you know, then come back over and paint that. That's pretty easy for me to do. I can see it well enough to do this. Okay. So I can get on to the next part of my painting with that fairly easily. And if for some reason any part of that traceable was outside of my paint, I would just allow everything to dry. And when it was completely dry and cured with a damp brush, I would remove any excess watercolor or serial paper residue. Oh my goodness, guys. Do you got the that's all, folks? I, I think that we have something like that. I know this was a big class, bigger than I initially had thought it would be, but I realized I'm not doing you any favors by not telling you the stuff you need to know. Take it in, watch it twice, practice the techniques, because it absolutely, every one of these things is going to come up in your first years of painting. Every one of these things is going to be something that you have to know how to do. And they are challenges that beginners will be faced with it because the truth is whether you're a very experienced painter or you're a beginning painter having to fix mistakes is something we all have to be able to do knowing how to paint solid fields of color these are all things no matter where you are in the journey of painting are skills you have to have so it's important for you to know them if you want to have a confident and enjoyable experience when you're painting but here's the cool thing guys none of this was talent based Mm -hmm. It's not some mystical, magical skill that you're born with. It's just knowledge. And whenever you see something that's a little bit of work, but just knowledge, it means you can do it. Nothing is between you and success. There's not some weird genetic lottery between you and being able to paint. So if you have been a person up until this moment who said, well, my aunt was really good at art, but I didn't inherit any of that talent, pump the brakes on that for a second and think about what we did today. All of these things are the things that make a painting successful. None of them were talent based. Yeah. And I'll tell you a secret. I've been an artist my entire life and I come from a family of artists and I have friends that are artists and I'm not saying that there isn't acuity or that, you know, some people don't have great instruments, but talent, what most of us are talking about when we say talent is skill with story, life experience, what that person brings to the table, right? So when you have a lot of skills and you are able to tell your story authentically, people are going to start telling you that you're talented. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say it. It's totally cool. It, it means it. You are talented. You put together your skills and what makes you a unique, special person who told yeah. your story. Um, so hopefully you realize, oh man, 90% of what's exactly what I said at the beginning, isn't it? Yep. 90% of what goes wrong for you guys has nothing to do with you. It's about knowing this stuff. This is all learnable. You can do it. And when you can do it, you can do all the one who paintings, all those beginning paintings. You can do them to the point where you're like really proud of it. These are the things that you've got to know how to do mm -hmm. next week. No, not Thursday. Soon. Soon. <laughs> it is Thursday. We are going to come together and go over brush strokes, and we're going to take those brush strokes and make specific objects. All right. That you've got to be able to do when you're first painting. And if you can make these objects, then you can kind of compose artwork much easier and have a better result. So we've got these skills, practice these. If you're here on the replay and you thought this course was, well, it covered it what you actually needed to know and you thought that was cool, hit the like, comment, and subscribe and do those human things. Go to my website and join the beginner acrylic painting course. It's free. You just, you don't even have to log on. It's just a button. You click it. It'll take you to the whole course. You can do it any time of year. You can be any age, any level of painting to get something out of it. If you are here and you want to go to the live Q&A, well, head over to Facebook. Give us okay. a minute to make some coffee. I need some coffee, folks. Uh, I meet you in about 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah, I think we can pray to you something. If you're here on the replay and we didn't get to your question, leave that in the comments below. Other than that, I will try to catch everybody's questions from today's live show over on Facebook. All right. Be good to yourself. Be good to each other. And I will see you at an easel really soon. Bye-bye.